Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, we changed mods, so today, for the next five talks, I'll be moderating. Uh, thank you again. So now we're going to have Etienne Meunier talk about defending human rights in the age of targeted attacks. Etienne Meunier is a security researcher and activist working in the Amnesty Tech team on digital surveillance of human rights defenders. He enjoys political discussions, weird malware tricks, humus, and hate illayism which is the act of um, talking about oneself in the third person. So thank you and uh, enjoy the talk. Hi, everyone. It's, it's great to be there. Uh, I'm sad I couldn't be with all of you in Montreal, but thanks for the NORSEC team to make all the work to make this happen. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you are going to see uh, slides in a bit. It should work now. Um, so I am Etienne Meni, I'm working for Amnesty Tech, I'm a security researcher, I'm also a research fellow at the Citizen Lab, and so basically I worked in the industry for some years uh, before moving to uh, more uh, this kind of uh, security research. So before getting into the work I do uh, with my colleagues and we do at Amnesty Tech, um, just a few words about the security industry. So when I started working 10 years ago, um, I mean, APT was not even a thing. Uh, defensive security was not really taken seriously. The cool people at the conferences were uh, pen testers. Um, like, of course, you had a few people looking at IDSs, but uh, targeted attacks were not yet a thing. And so it was not really serious. And I think one of the things that, uh, one of the events that changed that a bit was the Aura attack in 2010, uh, when basically Google said, oh, we were hacked by uh, targeted attacks by Chinese attributed group. And this one of the events that revealed that targeted attack were a thing. And uh, after that, a lot of companies started to um, openly say that they were hacked or more often would not say it, but journalists would still publish about it uh, because everyone was kind of shy about that. But it created quite a big change in the security industry. And so looking back at this um, 10 years later, um, the security landscape is pretty different. We now have um, a lot of people working in threat intelligence, intrusion detection. We have way more tools, services. Uh, passive DNS for a thing was like non-existent uh, 10 years ago. Um, and so the industry has evolved to basically change the market, the people working. Uh, you now have conferences dedicated to that. Even Norsec, a large part of the talks were um, are about uh, defensive security. And, and so the industry now, if you work for any large industry, it's very likely that your company has some boxes to analyze every email, especially attached file entering the network, boxes to analyze every uh, network traffic going out of the network and so on. If we look more now about what's happening for human rights defenders, uh, one thing we know is that the same attack that targets industry and governments also target human rights defenders. One example of that, uh, a month ago, Google uh, the threat team at Google published an interesting blog post about um, APT28, also called Sunworm, which is this Russian attributed group, and the evolution of their targets. And if you look in the list, you see of a few companies, automotive, finance, real estate, a lot of government organizations, especially in Ukraine, uh, in the context of the annexation of Crimea. But you also see uh, several organizations that are clearly defending human rights, uh, anti-corruption organizations, charities, uh, LGBTQI media. And so now we have a lot of evidences that the same groups um, that target companies, governments also target human rights defenders. But the defensive security for human rights defenders, the digital security is a completely different question. Of course, there are a few large organizations uh, like Amnesty Human Rights Watch and a few others that are kind of organized like uh, companies and to them, definitely the tools and services that the industry has are also available, even though they are often underfunded uh, compared to um, a company of the same size, for instance. But most individual and small organization uh, are actually, um, human rights defenders are actually mostly individual and small organization. And for them, it's really hard because first they are already at risk. They are often threatened and threatened physically. They are often doing their work in, uh, in very hard condition, in a very hard situation. 
Let's think about freelance journalists covering like corruption. Uh, let's think about lawyers fighting for human rights in some countries. And so the technology is adding another layer of threat to them and the impact if they are compromised would be uh, huge. Uh, for instance, they could be jailed, they could be killed, or uh, some people they work with uh, could be uh, arrested or killed or forced to leave the country, for instance, sources of journalists um, and things like that. And, and if we look at the likelihood, at the same time, they do not have access to the digital security or even the funding that companies, people in companies would have. Um, for instance, um, often they have limited technical skills. Um, some people are definitely more tech savvy, but they don't have access uh, easily to people supporting them technically. And they often have limited funding to a point that just buying an Android phone that's up to date uh, could be challenging. So uh, I'm working at Amnesty International. I guess a lot of you have heard or seen this logo. Amnesty is a human rights organization that started in the 60s in London uh, at first to fight against the imprisonment of political opponents and then started to tackle more and more uh, other human rights issues. And now um, Amnesty International is a large organization tackling uh, human rights everywhere in the world. And some years ago, it became obvious for um, uh, some people at Amnesty, that technology was becoming a human right question too. First, because technology is changing society in a way that can create human right issues. An example of that is a wor interesting work done by some of my colleagues uh, last year called Servant Giant that's looking at how the business model of Google and Facebook threaten human rights. Basically gathering private information about billions of people create human rights issues. So that was an aspect of it, all the question about the change in society, artificial intelligence and so on. But Amnesty is also doing a lot of work to support human rights defenders take, uh, directly um, in a lot of different ways. Could be legal support, could be funding, could be a lot of things. And in that um, work, there is also the fact that human rights defenders more and more are facing digital surveillance as a threat to them. And so there is now another part of the team in which I am, and we are investigating uh, target attacks against human rights defenders. And for that, we have a security lab, what we call security lab, which is a, a group of people in different places over the world doing uh, technical investigations. And we do investigation, digital security support, and try to develop tools and technology and share that knowledge. So I'm going quickly through, uh, I'm going to go quickly through two examples of reports we published um, over the past year. I think are two different examples that are interesting and complementary. The first one is about um, attacks against Uzbekistani human rights defenders. So Uzbekistan, you may know, is this uh, country in Central Asia, former uh, US, uh, former uh, Soviet, Soviet country. Um, one th uh, there are a lot of questions about human rights abuse in Uzbekistan. Um, Amnesty and other organizations have uh, raised the issue of forced labor, but also torture or, uh, and a lot of repression of human rights defenders. One thing to uh, point out about Uzbekistan is that because of this um, threat intelligence um, industry in which we in, in which we are, we are um, there are some countries that are research a lot: uh, Russia, Iran, China. But some other countries are definitely not researched that much. And Uzbekistan is one of these countries where we had very little information about the servant there until a few years ago. Uh, it, it has changed quite a bit because of um, a few reports I'm going to talk about. But also now we know that. They were a customer of Hacking Team, for instance, but also Kaspersky has done some work on the group they call Suncat that are tribute to the state services. So we now have a bit more information about that. So the first work by Amnesty on actual digital surveillance um, was in this report called We'll Find You Anywhere in, in 2017. And if you have the chance to have a look at it, I think it's a very good example about how the impact of targeted attacks is very different for human rights defenders. Uh, one of the um, testimonies there is in this report is uh, from a journalist who created this um, online media, independent media, trying to cover Uzbekistan called uznews.net. And she was actually hacked, her mailbox was, was hacked, and the um, emails were released online. And that created a lot of trouble for several people in Uzbekistan who were anonymously, an, anonymously working with her from Uzbekistan to a point that several of them had to leave the country and be in exile. And one person in exile from this report is even talking about how he's not even calling 
his family within Uzbekistan because he's afraid that because of digital surveillance, he would put them at risk of retaliation. So um, it shows that first, this kind of attacks was already there quite a few years ago. The attacks, this attack I'm mentioning is from 2014, but also clearly shows this big difference between what the impact is for the industry and what the impact is for human rights defenders. Um, two years ago, I was working in late uh, 2018 for a nonprofit called Equality, which is um, protecting um, digital uh, website for political organizations. And I was actually doing investigations uh, on this attack. And somewhere in December, I found this weird IP address doing a lot of um, web scans, uh, pretty basic WordPress scans, these kind of things. And But what I found was this one IP was actually used as a proxy to target a lot of websites, and pretty much all of them were related to Uzbekistan. And by digging more, um, what happened that there was a coordinated attack uh, for two to three years using a few IP addresses that were doing a lot of uh, web scans, but also hosted phishing domains and, and use these phishing domains and um, phishing emails to several uh, human rights defenders uh, from Uzbekistan. And so that was interesting as for me, um, a, a first work um, on the attacks from this country, uh, but also what's interesting uh, is that this campaign had been running for at least two years, two to three years, without either being researched at all by anyone or without anyone reporting about it, which is also another point about how under-researched some countries are. So last year, um, last year um, when I joined Amnesty, we started to um, track this campaign, see what's happening, see the change in infrastructure, and we find a few things. First, we, we found uh, that the campaign continued uh, through a lot of phishing, but also we found more malware. So I'm going to go through quickly um, the different bits and pieces of it. The first one was a lot of phishing, like a lot of phishing, more like more than 70 domains, I think. And at first it was pretty basic. It was mostly um, a fake login page, which is what you see most of the time in phishing. But in, 20, in May or June last year, we saw them change to use instead a more complex phishing framework. Uh, and this phishing tool, instead of just copying the page, would act as a relay between the victim and Google. It's pretty obvious when you find the domain, you see this one, which is one of the domains from the campaign, and when you interact with it, you basically can interact with all the Google services because it's acting as a reverse proxy. And this has one interest, which is that uh, it can bypass most forms of two-factor authentication. For instance, when you log in, you put your login password, then you get this code by a text message. And when you enter the code, it would actually work because the code would be sent by the attacker to the real Google server. And the real Google server would give an authorization token that would be recorded uh, by the attacker, which would get access to your account. And this is not new. Uh, it was discussed quite a bit in 2016 in the security community. There are a few uh, open source tools out there to do that. But since um, mostly 2018, mid 2018, I would say, uh, we st have started to see this more and more use uh, in the wild. And actually my colleagues have uh, written a report in December 2018 um, with a complete different group using the kind of same technique. And so the only thing that protects against this attack is using hardware keys because the keys would check the domain before putting any uh, token in it. And so we are now recommending more and more to human rights defenders to use this kind of UB keys, hog keys, and all these hardware keys, even though we know it's, it can be hard to use, uh, especially for less technical people. We also found some Windows malware. Um, nothing really fancy. The Windows malware was a backdoor telegram desktop with uh, a few tools taken from open source um, rats, and then some VBS script to gather the password, the cookies, the screenshot, and send them to a remote server. Um, so it was pretty uh, simple and not very complex. And same for the Android malware, actually. It was an open source, uh, a fork of an open source malware. Um, the only difference was instead of having the C2 hard coded, it was actually uh, querying a Twitter profile. And this weird string you see in the profile is actually the encoded uh, C2 uh, domain. 
One interesting thing is that during the investigation, we found one uh, folder with uh, a lot, um, an open index, uh, completely openly available, and a lot of HTML files. And these were actually um, templates of phishing email that included the, um, for some of them at least, the target. So that way we were able to identify several human rights defender targeted and, and reach out to them. So this was one of the uh, one of the example. You can see it was not very uh, complex technically. Uh, the second one I'm going to go through is definitely more evolved, and I will talk a bit later about this difference. Um, my colleagues in last year, my some of my colleagues did a lot of research in Morocco and uh, identified several human rights defenders targeted by um, malicious attacks using NSO Group malware. So you may have heard about an SO group. It's an Israeli company selling malware to governments. And so we identified two different um, human rights defenders. One is uh, Abdesadek El Bouchetawi, who is a lawyer. It's especially interesting because he's uh, doing the legal defense of several protesters that were uh, involved in uh, uh, large protests in the north of Morocco. Uh, the second human rights defender is Mati Monjib, who is an historian, but also um, co-created an organization for the freedom of the press. And between 2017 and 2018, we identified several text messages um, that were sent to them as an attack. And the, uh, the link was related to the exploitation infrastructure of NSO Group. So if they, if they had clicked on it, it would have exploited their browser with a zero date and their uh, phone with the other day and infect their phone with the malware called Pegasus that NSO Group is selling. That basically would wiretap and record everything happening on their phone and send it to a remote server. And we know that because um, in 2018, an Amnesty International staff member was actually targeted by a similar attack. And when uh, my colleagues discovered that, they did a lot of work to investigate on the infrastructure and were able to find a link between this 2018 NSO infrastructure to uh, deliver exploits and the same attacks we saw targeting Moroccan activists. But from 2018, then we started to see a different kind of attack. Instead of doing text messages, it used network injections. Uh, so network injection, how it works, is basically when the phone would um, connect to a clear text um, web page through HTTP, there is an element somewhere in the network that would redirect to the exploit link. And so the exploit page would be loaded by the browser, be exploited, and, and the phone would be compromised. So it's um, a tool we know is sold by several companies, including NSO Group. And uh, it's a way also to convert a one-click attack, like the text message, into a zero-click attack. So we um, do not have technical evidence that this is um, NSO Group, but it makes complete sense for that because NSO Group was already used to attack them uh, just before um, that they were very likely compromised by actually the same uh, NSO Group tool. So a few words about NSO Group. Um, NSO Group, so is it, it's an Israeli company selling malware to governments, officially to fight against terrorism. Uh, but we know uh, we have uh, a lot of evidences that it has been used to target human rights defenders again and again. And just a few examples of that. Uh, the Citizen Lab released a report in 2016 showing that it was used to attack a UAE human rights defender, Kalamid Mansour, who is actually now in jail. Uh, several uh, activists in Mexico were also targeted by that uh, same tool. Um, several people close to Jamal Khashoggi uh, were actually spied by this tool before he was killed. And we've even learned a few months ago that uh, one of the NSO employees uh, used this tool to target a woman he was into some years ago. Um, so we basically learn um, every few months, we learn a new case where this was used to target activists, journalists everywhere. And there are several legal actions uh, against NSO Group today. One of them, for instance, is WhatsApp um, having um, suing NSO because of the hack they did of the platform. With Amnesty International, we're supporting actually uh, a legal action in Israel uh, where we take the Israeli Ministry of Defense to court, uh, where we ask to revoke the export license. Uh, so the export license is a document that allows uh, NSO group to um, sell their tools outside of Israel. So we hope to 
um, stop that. So about lessons learned, um, a few things. The first one is most attacks we see are not technically complex and they are actually way closer to the Uzbekistan case I show you than the Moroccan case I show you. And there is a lot of there are a lot of discussion in the security community about zero days very complex and advanced attacks and and I think they are legitimate, but way too often we tend to dismiss the attacks that are not complex, even though they create um, a big uh, security issue for a lot of human rights defenders in the world. An example of that is people are still hacked in 2020 by malicious macros in in Word documents which is a problem we have known for 15 years or maybe even more than that. And still, this, this is actually still an issue for a lot of people. People get compromised daily by these kind of attacks. So I think we have an issue in, on that in the security community that we focus too much on the cool, new, fancy things and not focus enough on a lot of simple attacks that are actually a big issue. Another lesson is some political contexts are under research. There is a lot uh, of research done on some countries, uh, China, Russia, Iran, uh, and this is because of an alignment, I guess, of uh, some government interest and some um, um, companies' interest. But there are a lot of countries in which we know very little, and that's an issue because it's very hard to support human rights defenders from these attacks without having knowledge of what's happening. And the last thing is human rights defenders are not reading threat reports. And if you work in a company now, um, if I publish tomorrow a threat report with a list of malicious domains, it's very likely that these domains will end up in a list of a threat feed somewhere that will be pulled more or less automatically uh, onto a device on your network, and this domain will be blocked. So publishing something directly means often increasing the security of companies. This is not working at all for human rights defenders. For it to work, you need to have some people knowing the threats, and converting that into direct digital security support to them, helping them to change their hardware, the way they deal with their websites, um, doing digital security training, doing long-term support, all this. And this has to work through a, a chain of people who can convert the knowledge we have about attacks into something that can directly help human rights defenders. So to work on that, uh, we are trying to find some ways to improve this incident detection for human rights defenders. One thing we realized is that for forensic, for instance, we cannot really use cold forensic that's um, traditionally used in the industry because we don't have access uh, always to the hard drive. And even if we do, we don't really want to uh, complete, make a complete copy of the hard drive and, and then take it because that's access to too much data. So we have worked on the methodology to do live forensic and um, at least find ways to catch the low hanging fruit. Uh, check running processes, check auto run and hope that this is becoming more common because a lot of attacks are not that, that complex. It can actually be caught quite easily if you know what to look for. And to help with that, my colleague Claudio Guarnieri has developed several tools one of them is Snoop Droid, which is um, an APK, um, a command line tool to pull APKs from an Android phone, so you can analyze the APKs. And this one is called Snoop Dig, which is um, basically pulling all the interesting information from a system, so you can analyze them um, later on. So I, I think I have a few minutes. Uh, I would like to use these few minutes to talk a bit more broadly about the issue of technology and human rights. So when I started playing with technology, and I think like some of you um, in the 90s, mid 90s, um, it was pretty different because for one, the internet was way less connected with um, the rest of society. So you could basically use the internet as a playground to learn and, and fail sometime without that much risk. But also internet was bringing a lot of hope into uh, creating more openness and democracy in our societies. I mean, Wikipedia was there and everything. And looking back at this from now, it feels like pretty different first to see how internet is connected to everything. You can tweet today and, and, and create so much trouble with the tweets or um, not even talking about hacking a server. But also like internet and technology feels that we are jumping a bit more every day into some kind of dystopia. 
And so clearly technology reflects society issues and in a lot of places our societies are not doing very well these days. But this clearly shows that technology is political. And so as technologists, developer hackers, we have a political role to play in that. And often we, we did not get into technology thinking about that, uh, but we are the best person to both understand how the technology can go wrong, but also to decide how it can be done or how it will be done. And a lot of people don't want technologies to take uh, political pos position or ethical positions. An example of that is um, hacking team um, was organized in a way that there was two different flow, one for the management and one for the technologist, um, so that the people building the technology would not know how it was used, so that they could not have uh, ethical questions. So maybe they didn't want to, but there was a conscious decision to avoid that. And I think as technologists, we have to jump into this discussion now and, and be clear that we cannot build technology without having the ethical discussion, discussion that should go with it. So what can we do better? Um, I have, of course, there are a lot of answers there. Uh, I'm going to go through just uh, two that I find interesting. The first one is just saying don't be evil is clearly not enough. We have learned that a lot and good intention doesn't lead to good action. So saying don't be evil doesn't help if you don't look at the consequences of what you do. And the first thing I think that I think is important is considering user at risk when we develop technology. Uh, and, and for that, product design makes a lot of difference. Um, when I talk about user at risk, of course, there are human rights defenders, activists, journalists, um, clearly, and I'm, and I'm kind of sad to see again and again people fighting with, for instance, bad abuse process in big companies that treat in the same way uh, journalists or media websites and small businesses. But also way too often women, gender non-conforming people, uh, LGBTQI people are actually user at risk online, especially considering harassment. And so, for instance, harassment is clearly due to a lot of decision in product design. So I think we really should consider that consequences when we build technology. And the last thing is, um, if I go back to this more specific topic I work on, which is targeted attack against human rights defenders, we need to we need to know more about what's happening. And in many cases, some people doing research on these attacks end up finding information about journalists or activists targeted, but won't do anything with it. And I get that there are a lot of cases where people don't have time uh, or there is too much um, um, pressure or it's not very interesting for the company or it's not a big focus. But withholding this information make them completely useless, while in a lot of cases it could be so useful to help uh, human rights defenders be better protected. So I think we really need to uh, improve that kind of connection to make sure that there are ways to um, share information about um, attacked human rights defenders and find ways to um, use information in a better way to improve their security. So that was my talk. I think I am um, uh, meaning for questions. Um, I'm sorry to take them. Uh, you can, of course, reach out to me online, either on Twitter or by email later on. Hey, thank you very much. I do agree technology is political. We have to consider this. Uh, it's nice to have a, a talk that is a little bit more light in the, in the middle of the day. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Don't hesitate to ask more people if you have some. The first question was, uh, how do you decide which group people to help? Like, how do they contact you? How do you know? Uh, yeah, if you could I tell us a little bit more about that. So I think within Amnesty, it um, depends on a lot of things. It could be uh, because so Amnesty is a large organization and there are sections in many countries and researchers working on human rights issues. So it could be either uh, quite opportunistic, uh, someone is reaching to uh, us to ask for help. Uh, it can also be that uh, in some specific region, there is um, an interest to doing more research there. And so it can be more organized research to try to look at what's happening and discover uh, some surveillance issues. Um, there are also other organizations working in some context. So sometimes we just redirect to an organization that's better suited to help uh, in the region. 
um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a mix of all that. Okay, good. Uh, do you have like a, a, an email that the organization can contact you directly and ask for help? Like, is um, it easy to find you guys? Yes, um, we, we, I can give my, you can contact me. Uh, we don't have an email that we give um, publicly because we're a bit afraid of being overflown under uh, too many emails. Uh, but uh, you can definitely contact me or some people on my team and find us pretty easily online. We have a website where you can um, also find information about us. Um, okay. so, yeah, if you feel free to get in touch if, if you have anything interesting. Or... Good. Um, a second question. Are there any specific types of attack that Amnesty Tech thinks will become significant going forward that you'd like the audience to be aware of? Um, so, yes, I can say a few things. I think this, uh, what I mentioned about bypassing two-factor authentication uh, in phishing attacks, uh, I think this uh, will be kind of by default now. We're expecting most groups doing phishing now to be able to bypass most form of two-factor authentication beside uh, hardware keys. Um, I think also we, we had several cases over the past year to see more attacks um, against smartphones. And some attacks are using zero day, but we also had several cases um, of attacking civil society with uh, old days, basically um, using bugs in Android that were like fixed a month ago. And because very few people actually have an Android that's up to date, uh, this actually works. So I think these kind of attacks on smartphones are also going to increase. Some with zero days, but a lot of them just with old days because the Android ecosystem is not working very well for that. Makes sense. And if you consider as well the digital divide sometimes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a massive issue. Like the discussion we have a lot in the community are about like the other day on iPhone that are updated, but but a large part of the planet is having cheap Android phones that never see an update for like years. Um, yeah. And that's a big problem, clearly. Agree. Okay, third question. Uh, what quick wins tips could you give to an organization like these trying to first build their defenses? Where to start? Well, I think there is um, a first question, which is like working on understanding the threats you have. Um, and um, the focus here in my presentation was a lot on targeted attacks. Depending on your organization, it may or may not um, be a big issue for you. We see also a website being hacked. Uh, you also have to consider often um, like the physical surveillance you can have, um, phone tappings. Uh, like you, you have to consider all the different type of surveillance you can you can face and find solution and and, and based on that, you can start to build a, a strategy and it can go, yeah, then it can go in a lot of directions um, uh, depending on what you have. Um, I think on the question of specifically targeted attacks, two-factor authentication is making such a big difference. And if you can use uh, hardware keys to protect your mailbox, for instance, like Google has said, we have not seen any successful phishing attempts since we have done that. So on phishing specifically, that's really helpful. And, and then the problem of um, malware in general is a bit harder to tackle, especially like if you're a journalist, uh, it's very easy to say, oh, don't open a touch file of people you don't know, but that's not very realistic for journalists. So then you have to find other ways to do that. Maybe having a machine just to open them, these kind of things. There's also probably difficulties if you're in the country and you figure out that you've been spied by your government. Like you do want to take measures to not be spied, but at the same time, legally, you see that you're in trouble potentially. Like do sometimes they contact you for legal advices too. So what are their options? Like, do they need to flee the country or? So yes, there can be some legal advice within Amnesty, which is um, outside of um, my team, but there are definitely a lot of lawyers within Amnesty. Mm -hmm. Really, the question is way different if you are within the country or outside of the country. Uh, if you are outside of the country, I think targeted attacks are more uh, because it's one of the few ways you can be actually targeted. If you are within the country, um, then there are already a lot of things that can be done without getting into that. Uh, for instance, tapping phone calls, um, geocalating your phones, and also just physical surveillance. And, yeah. and sometimes we, we my, I talk with people who um, are at risk and has some, have something weird happening to them. And the answer is more likely to be something kind of less technical um like like tapping phone calls like that's very classical and most states have the way uh, a way to do that uh don't target attacks even though target attacks are uh, 
quite common. I see. Good. We'll have time for one last question um, asked by anonymous person again. Uh, how can NGOs and other politically inclined organizations or low fund organizations hope to deal with the very rapid pace of technology? Like, should they have a corporation model or anything that sort of could help them sort of be together and move forward? I guess that's the question. Okay, that's a very broad question. <laughs> and I don't know if I can give an answer that just like summarize what you should do. Uh, yeah, I think it really depends about like what the organization is doing. Um, I think for activists and sure. defenders, a lot, a lot of people just have, for instance, started to use um, social network very early in social media because it was the right way to connect to people. But do you see them organize and cooperate together? Like, for example, journalists from different countries facing not the same threats, but in so the end. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I think there are more and more collaboration, especially on digital security, and there are more and more networks um, of of people uh, facing the same threats. Um, what I also think is that some people stay outside of this network um, just because they may not know um, that they uh, that they exist. And, and so one of the problems of this network is that they are working pretty well, but um, some people may be completely excluded without, um, without us really knowing it. So one of the things we're trying to do is definitely to reach out to more people outside of this network we know, uh, especially people fighting um, new fights, especially all the, for instance, um, indigenous fight, um, environmental fights that are happening a bit everywhere. Um, I don't know how much these groups are connected with these uh, traditional uh, existing digital security networks. Agreed. Cool. Well, uh, that's it for today. Would you like to say anything else? Or no, thanks uh, a lot for having me, and feel free to uh, contact me uh, anywhere on the internet. And hope to see you in Montreal at some point. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Thanks. Give us a ten minutes break for the audience, and then we'll be talking about DMA attacks. <laughs>